And we have a wonderful panel today for 2014 review, 2015 anticipation. Uh, Ray Pointer, who's joining us from uh, from Sydney. Kristen Luck. Kristen, where in the world are you today? I'm actually in the office today in Bend, Oregon, <laughs> All right. for once. All right, so Bend, Oregon. Uh, Jeffrey Resnick, and Jeff, you're in New Jersey, is that correct? I'm in Princeton, New Jersey, that's correct. There you go, and Simon Chadwick, and Simon, you're in hopefully North Carolina? I am in Durham, North Carolina. There we go, so world, uh, all over the world and coast to coast. <laughs> so, uh, so today we are going to talk about uh, a lot of stuff in 90 minutes. Um, and we're going to start off, though, by me asking a question from uh, each of the panelists, and each of you take a minute or so and answer it, on what was the biggest thing that popped out for you about 2014. Uh, and uh, Kristen, why don't we start with you? Yeah. I, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think for several years now in the industry, there's been this, this talk about um, supply chain specialization. And I, I quote David Backen's paper that he, he wrote for SMR quite frequently when, when, I, when I think about that and sort of what the state of the industry is. And I think, you know, we've sort of been predicting more and more of, of that specialization. And I, I think in 2014, one of the things that became at least really illuminated for me is that we were really seeing some, some change in that area. And I think that's what's kind of signaled the continued decline of some of the, some of the big firms. Um, I know Ipsos and, and GFK have both, you know, sort of struggled this year. And, and I think the big firms that are succeeding or at least showing less of a decline are those that are sort of pivoting against that that trend by either you know doing making acquisitions or making investments and I'm, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit more about that um, you know later on the, in the session today and I, I think secondly just the just the focus on youth I think has been kind of interesting from my perspective I know both the, the SMR and the MRS and the ARF have all you know sort of gotten uh, gotten serious about youth-based initiatives and, and really looking at the future of research um, and how we're going to attract, um, you know, new talent to the industry. But I think one of the, the areas that we're sort of missing the boat, and again, I think maybe we'll touch on this later on um, in today's conversation, is just even though we're focused on the future of, like, attracting younger researchers, we're not really focused on how we're going to reach out to those younger respondents that in many cases are, you know, only going to take surveys on, on mobiles or who are sort of device agnostic and, and that we're still not doing a good job of, um, of catering to them. So th those were my sort of two, um, two ahas, I think, about 2014. Okay. Those are good points. Jeff, what's your take? Well, I'm going to give the uh, association point of view, or at least the um, uh, CASRA Global Business Research Network uh, point of view. I think there are a couple things that really uh, happened this year. I think one is, you know, fair to say that the industry has, you know, um, I think because of the challenges or, uh, around growth in the uh, traditional market research arena, the, uh, the industry has really woken up in terms of the need to change. And so um, things that I've seen this year on an industry-wide basis are, are pockets of really uh, real in innovation that I think start to deal with and address some of the ills of the market research industry. Uh, I do think though, and I'm sure we'll talk about this some more later, that the issue of privacy has really come front and center for the industry as well. Some of it's driven by the fact of the uh, proliferation of um, passive data collection. Some of it is you know, certainly driven by news and media events around uh, security breaches at uh, retailers and other types of places. Uh, and that's, you know, uh, I think part and parcel with the ongoing issue of declining response rate and something that the industry really needs to deal with in a very proactive way. Um, I think the, um, the third, though, is also something that uh, Kristen just touched on, and that is the uh, need to look at the next generation of market researchers. You know, where are they coming from? How are we training them? What skill sets do they need? How do we encourage them uh, to enter market research as a uh, career? So uh, I, I think, though, that uh, the, you know, the, the other big difference between 2014 and uh, prior years is you know, a lot more, I think, gloom and doom in uh, prior years. And I, I do sense a, um, a state of reinvigoration uh, with um, uh, you know, certainly the the economy in the U.S. turning, um, some spots of revenue growth, uh, and I think uh, p uh, 
companies are seeing that uh, uh, the next uh, five to ten years can actually be a pretty exciting time for the industry, assuming one is willing to do those things necessary to keep their business models competitive. Good points. Simon. Well, I think Kristen and, and Jeff have made some very good points, um, which I would certainly endorse. Um, Jeff mentioned that um, he'd seen a return uh, in some parts, at least, to confidence. And I think from my perspective, that's one of the bigger things um, that, that we've seen, that the industry is more self-confident. Uh, the doom and gloom, it's not totally passed, and certainly for some companies, particularly the larger ones, uh, that you know, find change more difficult. Uh, obviously, there are difficult times, but I think there is a general return of confidence that we haven't really seen since 2009. Um, I think it's also been a year of acceptance, finally. Um, acceptance that change is real uh, and acceptance that it can be good. Uh, there's much less naysaying about the pace of change than there was. Uh, much more willingness to confront what that change means, uh, and much more willingness to believe that actually it it charts a future for the industry that is uh, a healthy one. Um, it, it's not so much now about the dangers that we see from big data or from analytics. Um, it's about how do we work with them, and that's the other thing I think that has happened. Uh, is an acceptance that the industry is bigger than we have traditionally said it was. Um, that the, the companies and, and allied industries that we've tended to view as being outside the industry or on the margins are actually fundamentally part of it. Um, and that has been led in many respects, not only by individuals uh, banging on about it, but also by uh, some of the associations, most notably uh, the Dutch and the British and SMR um, taking the lead and redefining what the industry is. So I think all in all 2014 has been um, a pretty good year. Obviously not for everybody, but I think for an industry that has been gazing at its navel uh, for a long time, I think finally we're looking to the future with some confidence. Okay. Inspiring. Ray. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to start off with echoing that. I think I would say it's almost more about happiness um, than, than confidence. The, the industry is much happier this year. Um, the buzz and, and a lot of the conferences has been great. Now, when we talk about the industry, there are really two. There's the half that's made up by the big six and the other half, and it's much easier to tell the half, about the half that's made up of thousands of companies because they are the ones that are more present at conferences, events, and so on. That's clearly where the buzz is. Now, I suspect that that is partly the things that Simon's been talking about. It's partly the new energetic companies are really coming through. Um, so Qualtrics, Vision Critical, Insights, Decipher, um, Truth, Flamingo, Mesh Planning, all of these companies who are inherently positive are becoming a stronger part of the industry and the ones who quite a lot of the smaller companies who are struggling are no longer with us unfortunately um, and so what is left is a happier bunch so I think that is it's definitely one of the big trends and one would hope that that would continue but for my, my second theme really would be that mergers and acquisitions is back and Simon can speak more authoritatively on this later and the section of it that's really caught my eye are the, the number of mergers and acquisitions involving large Japanese research companies. Japanese research for many years has looked relatively inward or it's looked at just APAC. I now think we're going to see some really quite big news on a global scale. We've got some new companies at the top end of the, the, the size indices so I think that is going to be fascinating for the next couple of years to see how that pans out and what else happens in that space so I gave myself the unenviable 
role of, uh, of being last here, but I'll, I'll take a stab. So um, echo what everybody else said, and, and I was thinking, what, you know, what else? I think one, uh, so many years, I actually remember, Ray, uh, the first time that we did this four years ago, arguing about uh, mobile and the tipping point. Well, we, we reached the tipping point, and I think we all agree on that. So that's almost become old news now, um, and that kind of falls under the, the acceptance category. Right. There are even industry. books about it. There are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> there, there are indeed. Uh, there are handbooks on mobile market research, aren't there? Um, uh, <laughs> uh, good plug, my friend. Um, so, uh, but more interesting for me uh, is uh, I think that we also began to see a tipping point uh, that is driven by embracing non-conscious approaches. Um, and uh, for years, we've even in the grit report, we've had, we've we've seen that very niche activity. Um, but yet, the the client side interest in understanding consumer behavior at a deeper level uh, seems to reach a bit of critical mass this year. And I think that's driven by you know, the innovation in technology, where you know we're not relying upon fMRI and EEG and those type of approaches anymore. There's lots of new technologies, many of them embedded in consumer devices uh, themselves that can help aid that process, um, which has created lots of new entrants into the marketplace uh, that are, uh, are are bringing those solutions to bear. So I think that's interesting. And then the, the other thing that popped out for me was the advent of automation, um, with probably one of the best examples of that would be in Zappy Store. But, uh, but not just that, USAMP, uh, uh, tons of other companies have, have rolled out solutions that are taking uh, a fairly good chunk of traditional research uh, from a, a, a business issue standpoint, you know, concept testing, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and automating that very effectively. Um, and most interesting is seeing the big boys actually giving away their IP to join that movement of recognizing that they can't beat it, so they might as well join it. Um, so I think that's fascinating to see uh, companies realize that uh, that they're their standard approach to copy testing or concept testing, whatever the case may be, is not necessarily a differentiator for them now and won't be in the future. So they're recognizing that what can be automated will be automated and are joining in. And what does that mean for the future? Uh, what, what other things will be automated next? So that's, uh, that's interesting. So uh, there are a couple things that you guys brought up, and I want to circle back around. Uh, First, to the idea of the investment outlook and, and mergers and acquisitions, and as Ray said, Simon, you are kind of the leading expert on that. So, if you looked at 2014, and then with an eye towards 2015 as well, uh, what's the story for this year, and what do you think we'll see next year? Well, let's start with um, with the M&A scene first, Lenny. Uh, I, I totally agree with Ray that the most interesting development has been. Um, the, the the waking of the, the sleeping Japanese giants, um, and it's, uh, for so long now they've just kept within their borders, and now we're seeing them uh, not only stretching out into uh, the rest of Asia Pacific, but uh, also looking uh, very attentively at the uh, U.S. and, and Europe, um, and I think the one of the most fascinating acquisitions this year or deals this year has been the uh, the merger of Metrics Lab and Macromill, two relatively young companies, two very successful companies, backed by Bain Capital. Um, uh, Bain first uh, acquiring Macromill, uh, and then essentially uh, merging it with uh, a, a very scrappy um, and, and aggressive European-based uh, company, and handing much of the management. Uh, of the company to to Metrics Lab folks, um, that's a totally new dynamic. Uh, it's going to create a new competitor. I think that it's going to make life difficult for uh, others who have traditionally been at the, the top of the roost, and it may well signal um, a a shift in the types of companies that will be coming together in the future. It also signals uh, considerable interest. Um, in the private equity market as to what can be done in this industry. 
Uh, and we're going to see a number of, of, uh, of other deals, I think, where private equity takes a big bet um, on this industry. We've just seen, for example, um, HGGC has just bought uh, SSI. And you, know, you might not think that SSI is, is um, a poster boy for um, being at the front of the search. But in fact, as with many in, in that industry, uh, they are uh, developing technology um, that is in, right at the forefront of the automation processes that you were talking about. I think private equity is seeing this and seeing the potential in it. So that's, uh, I think we will see more of that. Um, on the investment side, uh, particularly the venture capital side, you know, we've seen an immense increase over the last three years in the amount of venture capital coming into the wider industry, so the, the research, the information, the analytics industries as they relate to marketing. Um, rising from 800 million in 2011 to 3.2 billion last year, of which the great lion's share was uh, big data analytics. And that was a category that in 2011 just didn't exist. Um, we're in the middle of uh, analyzing uh, capital inflows for this year, um, and although we, we have not yet got to the end of that, what is fascinating is that that bubble that we saw in 2013 in big data analytics appears to have burst. Um, and the, you know, the, the glut of investment in, in people calling themselves big data analytics has, has really fizzled away. Uh, with investments now being much more focused uh, in areas such as customer analytics or in social, still in social media analytics. So we don't know the full story yet, but it does seem that there's been a, yet another shift. Uh, but what I think it, it means is that you know, the big bets will continue to be made on those uh, types of company that can really disrupt um, so we've just seen a huge investment in Qualtrics, for example, um, and that you know we will see we will see more and more of those big bets during the course of 2015 uh, as private equity tries to work out where the disruption is going to be. Right, so this Simon, may be... yeah, sorry, go ahead, sorry. please. Go no, ahead. I was just I was just curious, Simon, if you feel like we'll see more of the types of investments like we saw with Cantar investing in, in Zappy Store, for instance. I mean, I think one of the things that's kind of interesting is that I do feel like there is a move by some of the larger firms to invest in new technologies by doing acquisitions. So for instance, I, and I think, Lenny, you, you mentioned this, Nielsen's um, acquisition of, of Athenova is a good example. You know, Ipsos has been sort of infamous for years for doing acquisitions. But I think at the same time, what has happened in many cases that, 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 that you know, the younger, smarter technology company gets acquired and then they get kind of absorbed into this very tr traditional research environment that doesn't necessarily support innovation and disruption and fast movement. Um, and, and I thought Kantar's investment in Zappi Store was a particularly smart one because I feel like it allowed Kantar to get in that space without really disrupting Zappi Store's trajectory. And I'm just curious if you think we'll see more of that in, a, in the future. I think we will, Kristen. Uh, Kentar and WPP have been very uh, savvy about this type of investment for some time now. Um, it's not generally known, for example, that they were invested in market tools. Um, they were, I believe, I may be wrong, but I think they had a very small stake in research at one point. Um, and it enables them to get experience of new technologies um, without necessarily disrupting the technologies and to decide whether they're going to pursue them further or whether they're going to take the learning and take it inside. Um, Nielsen, I think, is also um, a very interesting right now. Their acquisitions this year have been um, very clever, uh, at times a little counterintuitive, like the, the acquisition of Harris. Um, but at the same time, you know, they're making sure that they've got stakes in the various parts of the, the market that they feel are going to be potentially important. Um, I'm not seeing it 
uh, necessarily from GFK and Ipsos. Um, you know, it, it may be that it's happening more quietly there, or it's not happening at all. Uh, but I do think we will we will continue to see Nielsen and Kantar make those types of investments, um, and maybe others will um, will do so as well. We're you know we're seeing, for example, um, investments in areas such as social media analytics and text analytics, where medium-sized companies are investing and doing so quietly and taking a minority stake. So, uh, yeah, I think that is a trend. Yeah, you know, there's there's also an interesting uh, business model pa parallel here, and that is the uh, the model that uh, big pharma has you know, has really taken over the past few years in terms of their research and development. Where, you know, just like in the uh, research industry, where we now have a, a proliferation of really uh, innovative um, young startups, some in business for for a number of years. Um, that's the same pattern that helped through with the biotech companies. So uh, I think Big Pharma decided a while ago that um, uh, their investment decisions can be much smarter, much more targeted by seeing what's new and innovative and then picking from what's out there. And I would not be surprised to see some of that same model transition over to our industry. Yeah, and we're seeing the clients take a direct route hmm. as well. So right. the uh, uh, Lowe's, obviously, the Lowe's Innovation Lab and hmm. and uh, very aggressive uh, move to uh, establish a variety of accelerator uh, uh, entities to be able to help support uh, this space as well as others. Uh, of course, Procter & Gamble uh, has done that for years. General Mills continues to do it. Um, uh, you know, Motorola, General, Mill, uh, General Motors, you know, all have made bets this year in supporting uh, you know, new and emerging companies. Uh, in a, a variety of ways, which I think is also very telling. You know, th those aren't generally as public, um, but as we you know kind of start to get a picture of what those look like, we can see ultimately where the client side focus is, and it does appear to be on those uh, again automation, big big focus area for them, leveraging lots of different data sources. You know, that's a big focus area, uh, doing more with less. Um, those all seem to be the, the types of themes that are emerging with the client side investments. Uh, and ultimately, anything that it allows them, the way I kind of characterize it, is to uh, bring down the walls between marketing and market research and get to that place where they're able to engage, understand, and activate consumer relationships through one integrated process. Yeah. So I think that'll be a big play uh, we'll continue to see in. Uh, in 2015, so so this may be one of those questions I shouldn't ask, but I'm going to. Yeah. Um, if we uh, if we had to, to think about companies companies to watch in 2015, uh, who are those companies that, that you think are most interesting right now? And if we you would expect to see some type of either investment or uh, M&A activity occur over the next year because they're just positioned well for that. Um, Ray. Well, the, I mean, the only companies that any of us are going to talk about are ones that we have no information about. So <laughs> <laughs> any of the companies I hold Fair stock enough. in, I won't mention, um, <laughs> for fairly obvious reasons. So I think that if I were looking to come into the space, I would want to get a share of the, 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 the interesting companies, so the, the brain juices, the insights, the mesh plannings, um, truth. I th these companies, I think, um, point blank, the coal company in Germany, I think that if you were looking to, I think there is scope to put together a portfolio of innovative companies. So rather than trying to take them into one house, the, the old, old-fashioned Cantar model when I was in a company that was purchased in 2000 was really to integrate things very closely. But to take those companies and to do something which is a bit like what um, Dan Foreman and you do, Lenny, which is in, with your sort of mentoring hat and non-executive director hat, but I could see how you could acquire those sorts of companies, bring them together, take all of the bits that are not research and make those sing so that they can really get out there and move the products forward. On top of that, there, of course, is going to be more panel source 
um, consolidation. Um, we're going to see a, a lot of that. We're going to see it at the traditional end, but also at all the innovative people, the people um, who like um, pole fish and things like this, who have got new ways of getting mobile sample, new ways of getting um, access to people through different forms of activity. That's going to happen, and we are going to see the merging of marketing and market research. So there's going to be some acquisitions on companies that live on that divide that cross over from marketing into the market research to create an integrated offer. Yeah, Ray, we are, we are seeing that more and more and more um, in our capital funding uh, tracking. The, the number of companies that are receiving uh, either uh, venture capital or private equity that sit on that divide is increasing exponentially. And I think that's going to actually be one of the very, very big challenges we have um, as we look at our own guidelines and codes of ethics and you know, the, the principles that have guided us uh, all these years. They're going to be challenged. Yeah, uh, yeah. single source, right? Obviously a great example. Um, well, single uh, source, but I think you know, um, Simon brings up a really important point, and, 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 and that is that not only will the guidelines be challenged, but um, taking a U.S. perspective, some of the protections that have been afforded to the market research industry will be challenged if there uh, is a you know, true merger of marketing and marketing research. Uh, so I, I think there's a very fine line that the, the industry really has to learn how to walk. Um, there are ways to do that, but I, I, th I think it's not an insignificant uh, challenge uh, going forward. Kristen, what do you think? Um, well, it, it, you just said something interesting a few minutes ago, Lenny, when you talked about you know researchers trying to do more with less, and it, that's an interesting point because it's. I just hosted a webinar earlier this week, um, and Aileen Baxter from Sky was one of the panelists, and and she, you know, specifically mentioned that that was a key focus at Sky, which is you know, like where where can we look um, at research we've always already conducted, or where can we make more use of our research, or where can we kind of bring in more passively collected data to complement what we're seeing in our research? And I do, I that's why I think that there's a you know, I know Simon, you mentioned sort of a the big data space is is kind of iffy right now, but I I do think when you kind of hone that down and you look at data management within research and some of the new mining tools and um, platforms that are that are coming out. Knowledge Hound is a is a great example. I don't know if any of you guys have had a chance to check out their platform, but that is like a a research sort of data mining and aggregation tool set that I think is really interesting. And I, I I do feel like it's a kind of an exciting time to be in research and and look at all these different startups that are that are happening. I mean, just looking at at firms that are kind of experimenting with geolocation, like Metric Wire, and um, even there's just an email, Lenny, I think I forwarded to you earlier today about a startup called Zapiator, which is is all about sort of geolocation and um, centralizing research through social media and, and geolocation that I think is is interesting. But then even when we look at at companies like SurveyMonkey, I know we kind of had a discussion about this before the webinar started, but there's been so much news that SurveyMonkey has been putting out recently and they're in this kind of acquisition um, mindset where they're acquiring more companies and they're doing more strategic partnerships and I really think that they're going to be a company to watch um, moving in moving into 2015 along with some of the you know the startups that we saw I know Lenny they were mentioned I think there were some some firms that were in um, in your startup competition a couple of years ago like Social Glimpse and Rewe which now are more established and you know won the next gen market research award this year at TMRE and yeah. I think we're seeing more of that those companies are gaining more and more steam and it's going to be interesting to see what they do in 2015. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree. It's uh, I have to admit to some level of pride for those companies. <laughs> nice that, work, uh, Lenny. <laughs> you know, well, you know, I got a good eye for talent. What can I say? Um, but the uh, but it, but that that's it. We're seeing more companies like that emerge that have. Uh, they're not only disruptive, they're, they're disruptive to an extent, but they're willing to play within the industry as a whole. And, and they're, they're trying not to be inherently disruptive. They're trying to, you know, so they come up with the attitude of, screw you, you know, we're going to destroy your business. So they're trying to find that collaborative approach. Um, right. 
I think I think that's a, yeah I think an, I think that's an you know something you know sort of an interesting learning or talking point moving into 2015 is that you know the technology entrepreneurs really have to learn how to speak to researchers and at the same time researchers really need to learn how to translate imperfect solutions into into more viable research solutions I feel like too much of the time as researchers we see something and we go oh well that's great but this doesn't really work for research because it's missing x x and x right. and so we stop having those conversations rather than looking at the bigger picture which is hey there's something really amazing and interesting here and I, you know I would say you know like sh shout out to Ryan Backer for instance at, at General Mills who's been good about kind of looking at the, that bigger picture of the technology and then figuring out how do I integrate that into my traditional research practice in a meaningful way and I think that's in many cases as researchers that's where we kind of lose it where we get caught up on like oh my gosh it's not 100 percent perfect and I can't plug it in tomorrow right. versus looking at it and seeing where are those special elements that I can really use to integrate and improve on what I'm doing right now. Well that reminds me we've mentioned Zappi store a lot during this call but they're right correct me if I'm wrong they just presented in IEX Australia yesterday and and I think that the lead-in that Stephen had was you know uh, cheap fast and good enough. Um, right. And, and that gets traction, you know. <laughs> Clients are, yeah. yeah, it is good enough. It is good enough. So, uh, did I did I get that right, Ray? Absolutely. And um, he starts off with he's got a lovely shtick and starts off with how many people in this room make their own clothes. Almost nobody puts their hands up. How many in this people in this room normally get their suits made as a or dresses made as a tailor dressmaker? Only a few hands go up in the room. We're in Asia Pacific. More people do get their stuff actually tailored here than would be the case in London if he had asked the same question. And then how many people go and buy ready-made stuff? And the, the rest of us put our hands up. And, of course, that's, that's the, the proposition there. And now that you can buy ready-made, you, know, you can buy link tests. You can buy conversion tests from TNS that way. That is, it's good for Millwood Brown and TNS, but it's fantastic for the Zappi store to say that in our list we've got these really credible product offerings and so you might want to look at the other new stuff as well because they're now sitting in the same context and and that's good and it's because it's not saying quicker faster better people are more willing to listen to it quicker faster and good enough it's a very strong message yep but so interesting Lori Reiser uh, and Lori hi it's, you're always on new MR. Uh, events and always good to to, uh, to see you on Twitter. Um, so there's lots of talk about big firms, trends and movements that are, but what about trends that are applicable to boutique midsize? And I think this this kind of leads in that direction. That if we're seeing the the commoditization, for lack of a better term, of uh, you know, concept tests and trackers and all of those kind of bread and butter uh, type of work that has helped make the big companies big begin to see that go away, uh, or at least be, be positioned differently in other companies coming in. What's the path of the small to mid-sized companies that, uh, as we go forward? So, well, I'm, I'm, go ahead. But, uh, I was keep... ladies first. Oh. Okay. Ha-ha. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> Gosh, it's great being a woman. Um, <laughs> Well, I think that I think that that small and mid-sized firms have a really a real strategic advantage because you have the nimbleness and you can move so quickly, and I think it's much easier to seek out new ways of doing things, new technology partnerships, new strategic partnerships, and experiment with them very quickly and figure out what works and doesn't work, because you don't have all the overhead and kind of oversight of, you know, you oh you've got to go through procurement or you've got to get this signed or this person has to sign off on it, and I think that's been one of you know, one of our huge strategic advantages at Decipher is, you know, we're, we, we are able to move very, very quickly on things. So if we see something, you know, and gosh, you know, sometimes it's just a shiny tinfoil ball and it turns out to be nothing, um, but at least we can quickly sort of suss out where the opportunities are. And also we're much more open to collaboration and strategic partnerships and not trying to do everything ourselves. And so I think, I think the opportunity, frankly, is even bigger for, for small firms than it is, than it is for large ones. I'd, I'd agree with that. I'd, I'd, I'd agree with that. There's another angle, just as well, which is that um, you know, the, the, the equal conversation to analytics and passive measurement is the conversation of getting close to the customer.
customer, mm -hmm. uh, empathizing with the customer, understanding, walking in their shoes. Um, and Lenny mentioned, you know, trying to get into the mind of the customer um, before. And that is where I think a lot of mid-sized and small companies can play. Uh, I think one of the great trends we're going to see in the next few years is the dissolution of the dividing line between quantitative and qualitative. We're already seeing it to a large extent, where you can have video, you can have images, you can have text, you can have numbers all in the same data set. And small companies that can do that uh, can then take the, the fact that, that you know, in many cases, it's their senior people who are interacting with their clients and are being more consultative, something that the larger companies find very difficult to do, uh, and, and really build themselves uh, a niche as uh, the consultative, uh, and not just analysts, but synthesis and, and the real storytellers in this industry. So not only can they be nimble, but they can also interact at a much higher level with much richer data. Right. I think, you know, Simon, you have a great point, and, and, and you know, Kristen, just to tag on to some of the things that, that you were saying. You know, when I talk to people uh, in the industry on both the client and the, and, and the supplier side, there are a couple, couple themes that really come into play. One is that, you know, a, uh, from the client side, the thing that is still more value than anything else is the ability to provide insight. Uh, and the, you know, I, I think a, a, a tremendous role of the small boutique firm, which we're seeing lots of these days, is to have specific expertise in a specific area, to know their clients really well, uh, to understand their business, and to really partner uh, with the leadership of those companies to help them make the business decisions they need to make. Uh, and I think you know that's a that's a unique op, uh, a really unique opportunity. And what's interesting, um, you know, Simon, when you talk about the decline in investment in uh, uh, big data analysis, you know, uh, I think there's two ways to think about big big data analysis. One is through the you know the software and the investment in analytics that I'm sure are are behind your numbers. But uh, I think the you know the other thing that's very important. Again, this is a a really huge role for small and medium-sized companies is the ability to bring together different streams of information and help the client understand what it all means. And that doesn't necessarily need to have, a, you know, a, um, a big data analysis toolkit. What it what it needs to have is somebody who really understands the industry, who knows how to look at disparate sources of, of data and bring them together, which is the value that a lot of market researchers bring to the table. And I think oftentimes the industry underestimates that value that they have. Yeah, we certainly saw that trend come out loud and clear in the most recent grid. Um, well, it's been there. It's been there for years. So yeah. Yeah, I'm going to... That's what I was looking for. Go ahead, Ray. Yeah. So positives and negatives of, of the same thing. So that one of the positives now, we had um, two... Two people at IX down here in Sydney presenting. One um, represented one way of doing it, one the other. So Ellen Barron from Ruby Char Char created a boutique, what, about five years ago now, I guess. And its senior researchers, herself, Chris and Hickey, well-known people like that. And what they offer to clients is the ability of only working with pretty much senior people. So it's a small company, all of whom have got senior proven experience and they can run a company on a small basis, manage projects and because of the, the panels, the international organizations, you can run an international project with quite a small team um, and the benefit to the client is that you're talking to senior people which is great. We also had Kevin Gray on the panel and he runs an international marketing science consultancy. He runs it from Tokyo. Almost none of his clients are Japanese. It's a one-man company. In fact, he was complaining that because he's been at the conference, his feet hurt because in, J in Japan, you don't wear shoes at home. His office is at home. He can go a long time without wearing shoes, and all of a sudden, he's out around at conferences. And that's a one-man person. So that's, that's great, and that's one of the strengths in the bureaucracies. You can now set up a quant business based on five people, 10 people, one person. 
You've always been able to do that with qual. Now we can do it right across the range. The problem is that this is taking senior people and giving them some fantastic opportunities. And where are the next generation? Because they don't train very many people because they don't have the headcount, and that's not the service they're offering. The big organizations, which are getting more factory-like, because that's how you automate, don't have the opportunity to train people in a breadth of tasks. They get really good at pressing the automation buttons um, for this concept test or whatever. So I think whilst we're in a really good era at the moment for boutiques, startups, innovative new ideas, I think we are creating a little bit of a problem unless we address it directly for where is the next generation of research knowledgeable entrepreneurial young people going to come from. Yeah, Ray, this, this though is I think where uh, you see a lot of efforts um, uh, on, on the part of a lot of players to work with some of the um, you know, this is a U.S. Per perspective here, but work with uh, some of the universities that are putting together market research programs uh, and to uh, help guide the development of the right coursework, go in and actually work with some of the students that are there uh, and, and really help train the next generation of market research. Uh, I, I think you're absolutely correct in that um, where that training used to occur in the very large firms is generally not where, where it's occurring now. But I also think uh, that um, Lenny going to the, to the GRIT report, um, when you look at the diversity of skills that a market, that an up and coming market researcher is going to need to be successful, it, it I think oftentimes re requires training uh, that has to occur at innovative courses in universities because a lot of that training is just not going to be available uh, with, within the, uh, the industry as, as Ray's pointing out. So I, I, I think though, I mean, one, I think one of my concerns, though, is that there's so much, I feel like there's all this focus on training and less focus on the environment, which is so important to millennials and to, and to the youth coming into the industry. And so, you know, yes, you can give them all the training in the world, but then when they try to go in companies that have, you know, you're going to be working, you know, 14 hours a day in a cubicle and there's no... Flex, there's no work from home flexibility, and you're going to be working on surveys that look like they were designed in 1975. I mean, that's where we're missing the connection between updating our research and how we work as an industry and what that means to attracting talent. It's like what I mentioned earlier, you know, there's a focus on youth, and all the industry organizations, I think, have a focus on that, which I think is amazing. But it's interesting, it, it's just as focused on the training versus on the environment. And that not just that doesn't just go for future researchers, but also goes to how we treat respondents. Hmm. So this makes me a couple of things I want to. Uh, I want to circle back around to this particular topic in a second. The uh, first, I don't know if you guys have been paying attention to uh, Missouri, the company that uh, Kim Debbie. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, so the, kind of the the Zappy store full service, right? That same model. You know, senior people agnostic about the technology and, and methodology. They will use yep. anything in any way uh, and leverage that and increase some real efficiencies from a cost standpoint there, take all the overhead out of, of market research as much as possibly can from a process standpoint and just focus on the full service. So that's interesting. Um, uh, let's watch them emerge. Uh, and then to kind of connect that dot to what we're talking about, the, the concern about the future, I wonder if we're uh, where future research is really going to come from is from the agency side. Um, uh, you know, you know, as as programmatic buying, data analytics, et cetera, et cetera, are are integrated more deeply into agencies. Um, yeah. You know, they are inherently doing research. They always have, but now they're doing doing it really a lot more simply because the technologies they utilize in their core business enable insights to occur. Uh, that possibly that's the path. Um, and to your point. Uh, Kristen, that's also a different environment, a different experience. Um, totally. So we, we may have some challenges there from a, a, a corporate image and fit, although I always think of uh, Adriana Roca at EC Global. Yeah. Um, yeah have, have you guys ever seen the video of her her uh, poolside um, office? In, I have. Uh, it's awesome. I try not to watch it. It makes <laughs> me really, really envious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
should look it up on YouTube. There's an interview with Adriana, and, and she has a mansion in, uh, in Brazil. And, uh, you know, all of her workers are sitting out around the pool. There's video games set up. You know, they just take a break, jump in the pool. It's, it's amazing. Um, so uh, companies like Gongos, Gongos has a basketball um, uh, uh, set up in their office. Um, so th there's hope. I mean, some companies are getting that, and I think we'll just see that as a natural evolution of, uh, of the culturally as well. So I'm not sure if that's going to be a it is a challenge. I think that's just one of those adapt or die things that right. companies will adapt. Yeah. Um, I think too. Well, Lenny, I, Lenny, I think, in a you know, basketball court. <laughs> yeah, Lenny, you're you're, um, you're right. Uh, you know, Reg Baker and I did a paper at Etima, uh this year on. Um, it started out as being how do we educate the researchers of the future, and it ended up as being how will the researchers of the future educate us. Yeah. And um, uh, one of the things that we were very impressed by was that the, 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 the skills, characteristics, environments, traits uh, that will be necessary for the research company of the future um, are very much aligned with the way in which millennials like to work, like to think, like to play. And that you know, we are already seeing millennials coming into positions of management. Um, it's, it's about 15% now, it's only going to grow. So I think I'm pretty optimistic uh, in that respect. Yeah, there's going to be the, the dinosaur firms, but um, they, you know, somebody mentioned earlier, they're disappearing um, steadily. And uh, the, I think it was Ray saying that, you know, that the industry is happier now, but it's also, it's, it's more of a millennial place than it was before. Yeah, yeah. So, so here's the question. What was your biggest disappointment in 2014? What did you expect to see happen that just, just didn't happen? You thought, what? You scratched your head. You said, well, I got that wrong. Um, or, or somebody else is just really stupid um, and didn't get it. Uh, you know, what, what was the, the biggest surprise in that respect? Simon, why don't we start with you? Oh, I knew you'd start with me, Lenny, on this. Um, <laughs> I, I have not really had that many disappointments, I think, this year. Um, I, you know, I, as I said earlier, it's been a year in which confidence, um, or to use raised words, happiness has, has returned. Um, I think it must be incredibly difficult to be in um, in one of the big companies right now, particularly GFK and Ipsos, uh, I, I think that must be something that is is you know, a great concern to management there. Um, so it's it's disappointing in a way that they're finding it so difficult to to adapt. Um, but at the same time, I see other big companies like Nielsen and Kantar adapting quite well. So. Um, I don't really see anything that has been a major disappointment. Um, maybe my colleagues will enlighten me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants to go first? I'll go. <laughs> okay. I, it, it's interesting because I, I don't think it's an industry disappointment, but it was a, a personal disappointment for me to see how much communities are taking off. I mean, this was something that, you know, we tried to get into four years ago, and there just wasn't much uptake on it. Yeah. And I think, unfortunately, we were just too early to market. <laughs> um, because I'm always baffled. Like, I, I can't even tell you how many calls we get a week with people wanting to do custom communities. I know it's a growing part of Kinesis business. I know it's a huge part of what Vision Critical is doing. Every client I go and talk to, one of the first questions they ask us is, do you do communities? <laughs> I'm like, damn it. No, we do not do communities. <laughs> Qualtrics just launched a community. Model. Yep, yep. And so I think it's disappointing for me because I feel like it's a missed opportunity. Um, like I said, I think we were just too early to the game, and we pivoted and focused on other areas, which have paid off exponentially for us. But at the same time, I am really, really surprised, and I think a lot of that credit honestly goes to Insights. I think that they have been, you know, the community brand evangelists of the world um, and really gone around um, 
you know, sort of toting the value of communities, and that's resonated and benefited a lot of people in the industry. So that's that was probably the biggest surprise for me of this year. Well, let's, next time we see each other, we need to have a drink and commiserate over the things that we were ahead of the curve on and right. abandoned <laughs> early. So, yeah, we need to. <laughs> It'd be a lot of drinks, Lenny. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff. So, yeah, okay, yeah, so um, my disappointment is a little bit different, I think, uh, and it's actually a disappointment on the, on the client side of the equation. Uh, and I would, I would frame it in terms of a question. Um, you know, is market research a profession or is it a corporate rotation? Um, you know, the, um, as, as we were ta talking about earlier, um, you know, fast, cheap, and good enough uh, is a mantra that, that you hear a lot. But I also think, you know, missing from the dialogue, uh, oftentimes on the, on the client side, uh, is an understanding of some of the required science behind what we do. Uh, and oftentimes you'll be working with individuals that are in the um, either the uh, you know the market research department. Uh, I wouldn't say market intelligence because I think some of those departments have really evolved to a much greater extent. Uh, but where the individual who's charged with getting some pretty important uh, information on which to make a decision doesn't have the requisite skills uh, and is clearly going through a rotation of sorts. Uh, on on their way to a different position within with you know within the company, and you know my my, my hope is that as an industry, uh, we really help uh, clients get to a different place than that, and I think it's our responsibility. While we're talking about new technologies, and while we're while we're talking about you know faster and and cheaper and good enough, to still have our clients recognize that there are underlying principles that when violated end up in information that doesn't help them and, and certainly is not going to pay off in the long term. Interesting. All right. Ray. Okay, a, a technology and then a people thing. So the, the technology, I was hoping we had got further this year with text analytics. Um, I think it's held back by massive overclaim by many of the players um, and I've only really looked closely at like five of the hundred the five I've looked at have all been a bit disappointing and with really quite big mismatches in terms of the the problems I have so when they illustrate what they can do with their stuff that's fine when I take one of my problems to them and say now what can we do with this real world market research problem it's, it's less forward, and I thought we would have made much better progress, so I'm hoping that in 2015 we make that. It's going to certainly be one of my priorities to try to find a range of good solutions that I can work with and feel really comfortable. Um, so that's, that was my technology disappointment. My, my people disappointment, really, is, is to do with the one-dimensionality of the research industry still. It is still predominantly white, English-speaking male um, and lots and lots of effort being taken by lots and lots of people but it's moving very differently and anywhere you go you, you go into London or you go into Amsterdam or you go into Sydney and go in on the train to your meeting you see very different people than you see then at research events um, and it, it's different Gender, obviously, there are a lot more men than women on the platform and speaking, but that is also um, go beyond that. And there are um, the ethnic diversity is not there. We don't have people in wheelchairs very often. Um, so we've got a long way to go yet if our industry is to, ref if the people running our industry and the people speaking on behalf of our industry are to reflect the wider society. The people working in our industry are more diverse. They're just not getting all the, the nice gigs. And there's, there's a funny side story to that, because I know that Annie has just uh, put a blog post up about the Sydney event, where she pointed out that 34% of the speakers were female, which is disappointing. It's, it's better than average for the industry, but it's disappointing. However, what I know, and, and Lenny knows from the inside, is where people um, were sponsored and therefore able to have a spot, those are almost exclusively male. What we're seeing is that when companies send 
um, people that they think need to sell on behalf of the company, they seem to think that men are the best people to do it. I have to say, I don't think they're right. Never <laughs> ignore gender equality. Um, I, I think that functionally they're wrong um, because that's where a lot of the overselling, overconfident, overclaiming is associated with testosterone, frankly. Um, and I think there's a lot of scope uh, to be a lot more diverse and, and moving forward. And probably the single biggest disappointment, and I, Laurel Flores is a, is a friend of mine, so I'm delighted he's been elected president, but I think that SMR has missed a chance to say we are in Asia by not selecting a president who is based in Asia and from Asia. And I think that um, that's not a – and when I say SMR, I do not mean – the people who run SMR, I mean the ordinary members, the people who actually vote in this stuff, have missed a chance to say we're not the European Society of Market Research, we're a global organization. And they had a wonderful opportunity. Um, we can do it. No, they didn't. I mean, just speaking to the, you know, to the, to the gender diversity, because as, as pretty much everyone knows, that's my, my own personal soapbox. But... You know, in Lenny's defense, he did ask me to speak at IAEX in Sydney, and I unfortunately was unable to attend. Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. I will, and I I have defended you on that, Lenny. <laughs> um, and Vanessa Oshima from Coca-Cola said the same thing, you know, that she had been invited and was unable to attend. And so, you know, I, I will say as someone who, who works with conferences and actively tries to get more women on stage, one of the issues that we have, and this is something that I'm, I'm really desperately trying to change through my work with women in research, is making sure that more women say yes and that they are stepping up and they're asking for the opportunity and they're submitting speaking proposals and that they understand the process that has to go, they go through. And both Annie and I have volunteered to serve as a mentor and a, as a guide for women that are trying to get into that speaking game and just don't know how to get started. Um, and one of the other things that I'm doing is curating a list of female industry speakers so that when conferences do want to go out and get a more diverse mix, they have a base to start from and they know who to, who to ask. And so I would say for any of you women that are listening in on this call, if you would like to be included on that list, please, please shoot me an email. Um, but I do think it's, it's challenging. And, you know, gosh, shout out to you, Lenny, for having as diverse a audiences you did because believe me I know it is tough to it's tough to get women to say yes and it is tough to identify a more diverse um, you know group of speakers when people just don't step up to the plate and so I think the onus is on all of us not just on the industry organizations but on us as researchers to really recognize who those people are and really encourage a more diverse mix and just to jump in again on right just <laughs> just, I think, just to say and also to jump in on ladies events um, not that he needs it but <laughs> Diane Bowers would have been with us today on this panel had it not been for a diary clash. Um, so we, we do try. Yeah. Uh, I, think, um, I think, Kristen, also um, the industry is, is fortunate at the moment to have some very, very strong uh, female protagonists. I mean, not only yourself, but you look at Melanie Courtright, you look at Jackie mm -hmm. Lord, you look at Diane Hessen. Um, you know, there are a, a number of very, very strong female protagonists, and the more that they and you can persuade others to, to be participatory, uh, the better it's going to be. But uh, I, don't, I don't agree that we've got a, a lack of them. I just think we need to see more of them. Yeah. Well, yeah, one thing that's interesting, though, I would say, and yes, if I'm right and uh, you agree with me, on the client side, I would say that there are more female senior leaders who are right. actively involved and there are men. Um, so, yep, do you agree? Yep, I agree. Yep. Yep. So, uh, of course, they're very in demand. So, up on stage, that can be challenging. Trust me, I, I, I bug Joan Lewis every year um, <laughs> <laughs> to come to IAX. Um, although, we did get Brent Armistead for, uh, for North America this year from J&J. &J, but, yeah, it, I mean, to the point of you know, research does need to be more representative. Uh, uh, across the board. So I want to chime with my disappointment, because um, I think it's a good segue into, uh, into our, our, our next session of talking about the future. Uh, and it was that we, I had expected to see um, some bigger movements of integration between uh, like Salesforce, uh, quite frankly, I expected Salesforce.com Salesforce to acquire uh, SurveyMonkey or Qualtrics this year. Yep. Um, so 
uh, was shocked that that didn't happen. Also expected to see either Google or um, SurveyMonkey acquire a full service agency out of sheer necessity um, to expand their business. So a little disappointed we didn't see that occur as well. Um, and I think that we'll still. Let me, let me, can, I, can I ask you a question? Yep. yep. Why would Facebook do that out of sheer necessity? The same reason that uh, Vision Critical had to become a full service company. The same reason that, that because they couldn't sell uh, self service communities. You know, Zappy Store struggling the same thing. You know, they, they yeah, didn't but Facebook. On it. Not, not Facebook, Facebook, Google. Google. Okay, but, but uh, you know, this, this is something that I, I find quite interesting because you talk to the big management consultants and, and they say you know, it's fairly much the same thing as you're saying. Um, you know, the big, the big threats are going to be Google, it's going to be Facebook. Um, uh, and I don't necessarily see that. Um, you know, if I'm Google, when, when Google set up Google Consumer Surveys, it was to monetize their canvas. It's a, a tiny, tiny, tiny part of their business. Um, and it's there with a, with a specific function. If they've done it very well, they've disrupted to a certain extent, and only to a certain extent, but it is there for a specific reason which has nothing to do with the industry. Um, we saw the same with AOL way back when with DMS. When DMS started to challenge AOL for advertising inventory real estate, AOL disinvested really fast. When LinkedIn came into the industry and discovered that there was actually a danger that the user experience may be tarnished, they moved out really fast. Yeah. Um, and Facebook was saying they're not going to, to give over real estate to uh, research or to try and get into that, that sort of area, I don't think, given the enormity of the rest of the business and the, the absolute, the absolute fundamentals, which is advertising. So don't disagree with the, the, the fundamental business of those companies is advertising. But if you think about, uh, before the call, we were talking about you know, how the uh, European Union is looking to break up Google for privacy standards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, those companies, they are data companies, pure and simple. They monetize their data via advertising. That's the channel today. Uh, but with the shift in, in consumer-led uh, data assets, you know, so I, I'd written a piece in uh, advance of the GRBN report about the, uh, you know, personal data is a, a asset class now. And there's lots of companies out there that are trying to work with consumers to monetize their data in a variety of ways, including research. Uh, one day, that is going to bite Facebook and Google in the butt. They're going to have to do something different. Uh, Google Surveys was an approach to start down that path through their integration of you know, do surveys, you know, give us your data, and you get you know, points in, uh, in the Google Play Store. So they see it. They see it. They're in the same position that Kantar and Ipsos and GFK are in having to go with Zappy Store. They either must find a path to engage consumers on their terms, utilizing data, because that's what they do, or they face disintermediation at some point down the road. That, that's my belief. And I think that we'll see I think, that emerge in 2015. I think this is going to be a fascinating subject to this, um, to this module in 2017, and you and I can come back and see who's right. I, Fair enough. Here's my two penny worth. If, if I were talking to somebody out there who wanted to set up a brand new business, um, I would say take something like the, the Ruby Charger we talked about earlier, get yourself five really good market researchers with some good track record, and and Focus on selling serv services that you can build around Google Consumer Surveys, Zappy Store, Rewe. So you're going to buy all this sort of material. Your input costs are going to be incredibly low. All of your margin 
is on adding strategic consultancy based on, on that database. Yeah. And I think that is going to be more successful because you need your really, your best people, your most able people, to have their entire profitability and income focused on the consultancy business. If you are in a tech business, then that consultancy bit, first of all, it's not as scalable. Um, that they, it has lower multipliers in if you want to sell and be bought than does the pure tech. And your really bright people get sucked up into the tech. So it's, it's quite hard in a tech business to make that side of the business really work. If you go back 20 years now, IBM succeeded by selling their tech and therefore they had to make the consultancy business work. Um, so I, I think we may see emerging companies who leverage those things as opposed to being inside those companies. The one exception, um, and I found it fascinating working in, in the UK recently on a report with uh, Facebook and LinkedIn, but and Twitter, but particularly Facebook, they think of themselves, they see themselves not as a social network, as an advertising platform. They are developing fantastic tools to sit alongside programmatic advertising, media mix modeling, really doing great attributional um, allocation of, of cause and effect. And I think that within that very narrow but very big field, they could have an enormous impact because they can attribute much, much better than most other media can do, and they're beginning to link into. And it'll be interesting to see how they and Nielsen, who are delivering compatible, competitive products, tussle. Uh, and Facebook by Nielsen wouldn't entirely surprise me. No, well, they, they did a deal this year where Facebook, or I'm sorry, Nielsen finally uh, figured it out that the only way they could really <laughs> do single source media ratings was through uh, the Facebook um, mobile platform. Yeah. So, you know, that, that was ideal. Now, has that worked? I, <laughs> I have no idea. But it was damn smart. Um, because I Facebook could do that you've business got all the same day long. Thing, you've got the same thing between WPP and Google as well. True. Absolutely. Uh, and, you know, and, and what's going to be interesting is, you know, uh, how those, those alliances do progress? I mean, does one acquire the other, um, or do they come to some sort of uh, amicable agreement of how they work, they work together? That I, I, I don't pretend to be able to foresee, but those are indeed very, very uh, powerful alliances. Well, it's more just interesting. Uh, sorry, you, there was just also something similar. I mean, Rentrack is doing the same thing, and they just bought a division of Cantar Media. So... Yeah. I do think that you know you, we will continue to see some of these larger companies making strategic purchases like that. I thought that, I thought that was one of the more interesting acquisitions of the year. Well, the that was one of the more interesting. Yeah, I mean, and and um, and WPP then ended up having a fairly sizable stake of Rentrack in return, yep. um, which is very smart, very smart indeed. Yeah, um, and 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 poses a huge threat to NMR. Yeah, so the Rentrack, IRI, Comscore Alliance, um, you know, between them, they're, they're cobbling together, uh, again, a, a, a massive single source uh, repository. So that was interesting. Um, yeah, I think the interesting is the Nielsen, the WPP, Google makes a lot more sense because WPP is also one of Google's biggest clients as well mm -hmm. because of the programmatic buying. So Nielsen and Facebook, eh, not so much. Yeah. Um, so... It'll be interesting how that plays. But so, so that, you know, we're, we're talking about the future now. So 2015, you know, or 2017, Simon, when we tussle on this again. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do we expect to see in this arena? What type of, of interesting alliances or, uh, or, or, or connections can we expect to see, either specific companies or in general? Um, Jeff, you've been silent for a few minutes, so... What's, uh, sure. So, you know, I think um, you know one of the one of the keys for uh, 2015 and beyond is um, the industry really bra uh, em really em embracing competition, which is something that we talked about early in the in the session today. Um, I think that there there's far greater proclivity right now for companies that have complementary offers to work together. Uh, I think it's going to allow companies to 
focus on what they're great at and what their core value is. Uh, and I think it's going to create some really interesting and very dynamic um, offerings out there in the market. And while we're talking about a, a lot of combinations of very large firms, um, I think when you look at the, you know, um, uh, called the mid-cap portion of our industry, that's where a lot of this very exciting stuff is uh, going to be occurring in uh, 2015. So it might be, you know, the uh, the association of a um, uh, of a uh, community uh, with a technology company that can, you know, mine things like that. Uh, I think there's lots of possible combinations uh, that are out there. But I think not only is it um, a um, smart way to work. I think it's becoming a much more accepted way to work. And um, you know, I, I think that, uh, and perhaps you know, I you know get on this bandwagon a little bit too much. But um, I think that at the end of the day, it's it, it's all about the insight and the value. If you're a technology company, are you enabling that? If you are a research company, are you providing that? Uh, and I think what has what has plagued the the industry is the inability uh, to change the, their models fast enough to stay up with the curve required to always provide that insight. Okay. All right, Ray. Sorry, I was muted there. Um, 2017, I think, is is quite a good timeline. 2015's part of it, so I really do want to see some good text analytics coming out of that. And I think if they take the focus away from Twitter and more into more open ends in the surveys, um, I've talked about it, lots of other people have talked about it, Tom's talked about it in particular, the two question satisfaction survey, how satisfied are you, why, um, is just so much a brighter way of trying to find out what people want to talk about than giving them your structures. And the focus on Twitter, because it's so obtainable, has led us down some blind alleys. It's quite hard as a person to interpret Twitter, never mind as a machine to, because of the, the games people play with it. But there are a lot of other places that we can use that. Um, so I, I think that is one of the areas I'm looking for. I think we're going to be seeing Ipsos and GFK go forwards or backwards. Um, and obviously, one would hope for the industry that that's forwards, but they, they need to do something quite different. Asia, it's going to be three years of really interesting times in the whole Asia area. Key technology is going to be web messaging. Um, it is growing so much faster than everything else. It's blindsided. A lot of the focus in mobile has been about passive. And a lot of it's been about geolocation. But nothing like the growth that's taking place in uh, tools like WeChat and Line and so on. So I think we, we can see some really interesting stuff there. And I think it's got to be at least a 50-50 chance that the enfant tribe are really of TNS, Yachtmeyer, is going to change fundamentally the way they approach tracking and do stuff. I think that they are leading the charge, not because they are the most innovative, but they are pretty innovative, but they're big, influential, and innovative. And I think that could be fascinating. With social media, it has Ipsos SMX um, as well. So to give them credit, I've seen things for both of them that uh, it'd be interesting to see how that plays. Simon, I'd um, go along with everything that Ray has just said, uh, and and I think web messaging in particular is fascinating, and we have been blindsided by it. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more prosaically um, and project that we will see the decline of uh, brand tracking as we know it, and certainly um, you know, the, the innovations that are being um, uh, put out by TNS and, and Jan, uh, they are a step in the right direction. I think there is a likelihood uh, that there will be other tools that will be even more disruptive um, tools such as Milo, for example, uh, which could really um, obviate the need for, for uh, brand tracking as we know it today. Uh, I think we will also see the decline of um, project management. 
uh, as people begin on the client side and the supply side to uh, understand that to be able to deliver meaningful insights uh, that can be acted on is going to lead, lead to continuous learning and nimble continuous learning at that, which passive data will make that much more uh, accessible. So we will see the decline of uh, the need for project managers. Um, I think we will very likely um, see the, the ending. I, I really hope we see the ending of the divide between qualitative and quantitative. Uh, I think all the tools or many of the tools that are necessary for that are in place. Um, you know, one company we haven't talked about um, uh, during the session is Focus Vision. They're making some very interesting investments, um, which could well place them in a in a, a crucial position for the um, concatenation of quantitative and qualitative. Yeah, and they're private um, equity backed, right? Uh, sorry, what's that? They're, they're private equity backed as well. To, uh, They're private equity. Yeah, they they are indeed yeah. private equity backed. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we will see that, and I think it's going to be the next three years. Certainly, are going to see the conversation about talent really um, you know, come front and foremost. Um, we need to understand the types of talent that we're going to have to have. Uh, we need to understand skills like synthesis, which are not yet well understood, but are going to be critical. Uh, we need to stop talking about stor storytelling and do it. Uh, we need to gain uh, a real grasp on data visualization. I think you know, most people would say right now that data visualization is, is nowhere near where we need it to be. Um, and we need to have people who are going to be able to, uh, to to really leverage the specialisms that are out there and which Kristen was talking about in terms of the supply chain, leverage those, bring them all together, tie them up with a bow that the senior management is going to be able to understand really quickly. Um, and so there's going to be a tremendous conversation about talent and uh, hopefully we will see you know, and real movement in that arena. So I think for me, um, it, it, one, it was actually a disappointment as well as something we'll see in 2015. Um, Google Glass uh, was a bust, um, although I think that they'll find a niche in very specific applications. Uh, it'll, it'll start to fill the void of, uh, of like Toby eye tracking. Um, don't, don't worry, Lenny. We've all we've all deleted the photographs of you wearing Google Glass. No, I own one. I own. One. <laughs> so, I, I actually uh, not only do I own one, but just two months ago I bought the prescription eyeglass uh, frames. So I haven't oh given up on it totally. Um, uh, but wearables, and particularly uh, smartwatches, you know, bracelets, Fitbit, those type of things, um, I think that we'll see a big upsurge in leveraging biometric data uh, and geolocation data coming from wearables uh, to an extent delivering on the promise of, of what some things that smartphones could deliver and getting us to that closer uh, scalable non-conscious measurement. So I think we'll we'll see that pretty big time uh, in, in 2015 and by 2016, 2017 it'll be just as ubiquitous as, uh, as mobile is today if not more so. Um, for uh, for the year, I do think this year we will see something happen in Salesforce.com, not just a partnership with uh, well, like they've done with SurveyMonkey, but something more data specific play for them. Um, so we'll see. I keep making that bet every year, uh, and I've lost it every year so far. <laughs> I have a hard time seeing why they haven't done anything yet. Um, so I think that'll be a big deal in 2015. I also agree that we'll see the emergence of a whole new class of, of uh, to your point, Jeff Midcap companies making big waves and, uh, and giving the, the big four uh, a run for their money. 
uh, I, I would not case shoes. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're they're going to feel a lot of pain, and they're going to feel it from a lot of sources. Uh, one of them is going to be you know Metric Slab and and Macromill, um, and we'll see some more like that. Lieberman, uh, Vision Critical, you know those are big hundred million dollar companies. Market Strategies, another one. You know all those companies are right at that hundred million dollar level. They are poised for some type of significant shift, uh, one way or the other. So. Uh, I think we'll see some movements there. And it won't be Ipsos or GFK or Cantar buying them. Um, they will either come in with some type of, of uh, external funding and do something different or some other types of deals. Uh, at least that's Hi. my guess. Hi, Lenny. Quick yep. exercise for you. Draw one circle, all the people inside an organization that use Salesforce. Draw another circle, all the people inside an organization that use conventional market research and push the two circles together until you think you've got the right size of overlap. I think there's a really small overlap between the people who currently use conventional market research and the people who currently use Salesforce data. The Salesforce data is very much more down the sales. It's not down around the brand building in most organizations. You get quite senior in the company before you get that overlap of the two strands of information is that right probably not but I think that is one of the one of the things that's held things back I, I think that a lot of it is just getting familiar with with all the function that Salesforce has and I think sometimes at the mid to more junior levels people don't have as much exposure to that functionality because it, it does have such a strong marketing tie-in um, and, it, and it's interesting we get lots of requests for tying primary research data with with that Salesforce data, but it's always very, very hard to artic for people to articulate what it is they actually want to get out of that. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest gap that we see, at least as it relates to to, to market research, you know, and and Salesforce. I agree with Lenny. I think I would be shocked if they didn't do some sort of research acquisition in the next, you know, in the next 12 months to 18 months, because there is such a natural tie in there. And I think a lot of it is just wrapping our heads around how how do those two data sets work together. But every every time I get every time I get that request, uh, Christine, to tie in market research data with Salesforce, I almost always have to say no, because the the permission to do that integration needed to have happened before the market research happened in order to stay legal, um, not even ethical, but legal, and the the request to do the integration so often comes after the data is collected. So uh, th there is a need and a desire. But the timing is so often wrong. Right. Hmm. All right so we are. Yeah, we're, if you, um, you know, go ahead, sorry, sorry, Lenny. Just one final thing, just to beat on Jeff's drum. Um, you know, as all <laughs> those things that you you have been talking about bring privacy again to the forefront. Right. And and we have an election coming up in 2016 in the United States. Uh, where I will bet that privacy is one of the topics being right. um, debated. Right. Um, it's, it's already huge in Europe, and it's coming uh, towards the States as well. And, that's, and you know, APAC has its own set of privacy rules. But this is going to be big. Right. But, and I have to say, for, for, for those listening, um, you know, Lenny, you put out a link to the GRBN report on privacy today. But it is well worth taking a look at, not only from the level of concern that's expressed out there on a global basis. This is a study of 23,000 individuals across the, the globe. Uh, but uh, I think also what uh, you have to take away from that study, the breadth of uh, characteristics or personal in information that people believe is sensitive that you might not actually put in that category on, on your own. So to Simon's point, it is a huge issue. It's it's bigger in Europe right now than it is in the U.S., but it's coming this way. Yep. Well, that's a good segue because we are coming up to the end of our 90 minutes, which is really amazing. Um, <laughs> I can't believe we've been on for 90 minutes. Maybe two hours was the better bet, but we'll, uh, we'll spare everybody <laughs> that. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, so biggest, biggest challenge to look out for in 2015, my vote would be privacy. Um, all it takes is one more really big public uh, debacle around uh, some type of, of major hack um, that, that affects millions of people. 
and I think it becomes a much bigger issue here than it is in Europe. Uh, so I think that's our big, big issue in 2015 to watch out for. Uh, so, Kristen, what do you think? What's my biggest, biggest issue in, in, in biggest 2015? Challenge, biggest challenge we can expect to see in 2015. I mean, I, I think, honestly, it kind of ties in with everything we've talked about today, which is that I think it's really critical for a lot of resource organizations to kind of reboot their business strategy. Um, you know, Jeffrey touched on collaboration, and I think one of the best things that research firms can do is to kind of leverage, particularly for small and medium firms, to leverage that sort of nimbleness and, and that ability to collaborate more freely than, than I think, you know, some of, the, some of the other firms are challenged by. Um, and I do think one of the one of the trends that I, I do see growing, and, and Lenny, you talked about this earlier, was just that that smarter data utilization and and sort of maximizing research. And I think there's lots of new technologies that are sort of emerging that, to make that happen. And I also think that we're going to see a greater emergence of, of of passive data with that and collaboration with that that primary research data. I know I I talked of data and you know you talked about wearables and sort of the, you know the IOT market I, I don't think I can stress enough how important I think that's going to be and how transformative it's going to be in terms of, of of how we work with data on an ongoing basis so those are sort of my things to watch out for okay uh, Jeff you want to add to the uh, I know privacy is probably on your list what sure uh, well it's just I think for 2015 privacy is certainly very high on my list because I think if we get it wrong in this industry we're a dead industry I think it's the core of what we're all about, and it's the core of what we have to protect. And, and I think the other thing, to, to Kristen's point, is um, you know, people in this industry have to learn how to work differently. They have to be open to partnering. They have to relook at their business models uh, because it is a different world. And I think you know, one of the as if if I go back to where we started this conversation, what was good about 2014? I think what was good is that people recognize that the world is different. Uh, and they came out of their shell a little bit in terms of being, rather than being scared about it, being open to uh, the question of, okay, so now what do I do about it? If my cheese has been moved, where do I have to go to? So I think they're the two things that I, I see for 2015. Okay. Simon. Uh, I would put privacy right up to the top of the list, but I also would put um, the global economy. Uh, we, uh, the United States, and Britain um, are chugging along quite nicely, but the rest of the world um, is, is displaying signs of distress uh, in many, many respects. So Europe uh, is continuing to be under stress. Uh, China is slowing down. Japan continues to be under stress. Australia is under stress. Um, Latin America is under stress. I, I think there's a possibility that you know we're going to see um, a downturn, uh, you know, further downturn. And I think also combined with that, uh, many many uh, major corporations are now trying to figure out how they invest in emerging economies to take advantage of growth in those economies, particularly when it returns. Uh, but they are not increasing their insight budgets in order to do so. They are taking budget away from the established markets uh, and putting them into those, those emerging economies. And that's going to place even more pressure on um, insight functions to do more and deliver more with less resource. Uh, and with resource that is spread uh, uh, across a, a bigger geographic um, palette, if you like. And so I, I think that um, there's going to be stress that is going to come into the industry. And although we're confident right now, I'm, I, I'm going to sort of reverse what I said at the beginning of this, which is I think that we're in for um, some, some fairly difficult times in the next couple of years. A sobering thought, uh, <laughs> uh, since we, we've just recovered from the last downturn. I hope that you're wrong on that one. Um, Ray, I, why, don't I give, so. uh, why don't you give your view and, and uh, take us on home. Okay, um, data privacy, absolutely agree with the rest of the group there. I would add to that accidental regulatory damage 
So you know, gov the international governments can take a view on net neutrality, distance selling legislation, auto dialers, and it can have a massive impact on market research without them ever intending it to because we are small and irrelevant to them as long as they can do their polling at election time. Um, everything else is, is pretty marginal. So we can always be sideswiped by that. I think the biggest threat is the economy and in particular Europe. I think it probably won't happen, but it's, it really could. Um, I just shout out, I don't think Australia is a stressed economy, Simon. It's now about 20 years since they've had a recession here. Um, as long as they can keep digging up the earth and selling it to other countries, that they're going to actually do quite well. Um, so, but beyond that, I, I would agree. And I think that we often need to get the right mindset. So if Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey become massively bigger and Ipsos or GFK were to go bust, that's bad for GFK or Ipsos. It's neutral for the industry. The industry will change. And if some people become much bigger and some people disappear, that is neither good nor bad for the industry. That is just what happens in a, in the commercial sector. Um, but it's rotten if it's you. <laughs> um, so with that, um, everyone, I'd like to, to thank the panel here. I'd like to thank everybody who attended the IIX, everybody who's listening in today and has been feeding uh, Lenny with the prompts that he's been able to use in this discussion.